Now, I want to ask you one question. Are you ready? It's a tough one. Ready? Oh, wait, one more. Is the United States a democracy? Is the United States a democracy? That's the question on the table today. I want you to take a few seconds and think about it. Is the United States of, a, of America, is it a democracy? Those of you who believe the answer is yes, raise your hand. Raise them high, be proud, don't be sh If you think the U.S. of A is a democracy, raise it up. All right, good. Those of you who believe the United States is not a democracy, raise your hand. That went up there. God damn right. Uh-huh. Some say yes. Some say no. Some of you didn't raise your hands, either because you're in the middle of an existential crisis or you hate it when people in large lecture classes force you to respond to yes or no polls. Maybe you even realize that it's not a question worth answering because it is a profoundly stupid question, yes? That is one of the dumbest goddamn questions you're ever going to find. Who with any sense is going to ask that kind of stupid question? Is the United States a democracy? Because the question implies a toggle switch, yes or no. Is the United States a democracy? Framed in that way, there's only one of two possible answers, yes, no. Okay. So, let's investigate. If democracy means that everybody feels connected to and has a meaningful role in the formation of public policy, everybody, from the, the wealthiest to the poorest, from the most powerful to the least powerful, everybody, people with you know, status in society, people with no status in society, everybody, if democracy means that everybody participates and everybody has equal access and everybody has a meaningful role in the formation of public policy, is the United States a democracy? No, of course not. I mean, you, you look like, I'm, I'm looking out at, at Mount Rushmore here. Stone faces, come on. Do, I mean, does, do, do you think this is a country in which everybody, independent of status, wealth, position, has a meaningful role in public policy formation? Do all of you feel that you have a meaning? I mean, are all of you, you know, excited about your role in, in self-governance? Or do some of you feel disaffected, left out, pushed out, abused, neglected? You know? Okay. So is the United States a democracy? Well, in that fullest sense of the word, obviously not. So is the United States then a crypto-fascist authoritarian state which suppresses all aspects of human freedom and leaves no room for people to be involved in self-governance? Well, some of you are saying, yeah, that's exactly right. No, that's not right either. That's not right. Okay, the system has problems. I spend a lot of my time thinking about the problems of the system. But we can recognize the difference between the United States and something like, you know, take a classic example of Nazi Germany or fascist Italy or Stalin's Russia. I mean, you can tell the difference between Nazi Germany and the United States of America in 2011, yes? I mean, if, let's, let's ask the question in a different way. If I gave you a choice between living in Nazi Germany or living in the United States of America in 2011, how many of you would choose Nazi Germany? The more cynical among you are saying, well, would I be like a general or? <laughs> <laughs> but no, okay, so we can tell the difference. So of course the United States is a democracy in some sense. The point is, it's a ridiculous question. But it is in fact the way the question is often framed. The United States is asserted, we're gonna talk on Thursday about some of the, the silly ways these things are asserted. We're gonna talk about some of the political platitudes that one hears. But the question, is the United States a democracy? It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Now, second question. Is France a democracy? Same thing. You'll get the, we could go through every country today and every country that ever existed and ask, is it a democracy? And the same response would be appropriate. It's the wrong question. The right question, I'm going to argue, is to what degree are the features of a society democratic? 
to what degree are the features of a society democratic. And what I mean there is not just the political institutions that we tend to associate with the formal idea of democracy, such as political parties and elections. I mean the whole society. If you want to ask, is society X democratic? Is country X a democracy? You have to engage in an actually a very deep, complex examination, not just of the formal political institutions, but the whole society. And we're going to do some of that. You have to look at the nature of the economy. You have to look at the nature of the educational system. You have to look at the nature of the media system. And you have to look at the formal political institutions. And when you start looking at all of those features of a society, you don't say, yes, democracy, no democracy. You come to some understanding of the degree to which that society is democratic. The degree to which that society is able to make good on the, the basic definition of democracy from the Greek, demokratia, rule by the people. That's what the word means. Is a society democratic or not? Well, it's not such an easy question to ask or answer. Now, what I want to do for the remainder of the, the class period is introduce a couple of what I'm going to call competing visions of democracy. Anytime you start making lists of two or three, let's be uh, uh, you know, honest, you are taking a complex world and simplifying it. When I say these are the two, what I'm going to argue are the two most important competing visions of democracy in the last century in the United States, that's taking a complex world with lots of different perspectives and reducing it to a nice little discussion of two competing visions, which means that I am taking all that complexity and washing a lot of it away for the purposes of simplifying, for the purposes of our discussion here. So I think this is an effective way to introduce that discussion, but I also want you to be thinking about all of the ways in which it's inadequate, it's not enough, because there is always more than two positions. There's always more than two ways of looking at it, and in the world there are a variety of these. But for our purposes, I want to begin this discussion of democracy by looking at these two competing visions. I'm going to call one of them popular democracy and the other managerial democracy. They represent two ideas about how democracy should go forward, two ideas about what is possible. They are normative claims about how the world should be, not necessarily claims about how the world is operating today, but claims about how the world should operate, normative claims. Each one of them is based on assumptions and assertions about human nature, about what kind of animals we are, about what values we should make primary in our political lives, and then how to best to go about trying to live those values. It's very important. Anytime somebody's telling you about their political idea, how a democracy should be structured, for instance, there are assumptions behind that. Assumptions about human nature. That's true of almost any claim we make about how the world should be organized. Somewhere underneath it is an assumption about human nature about what kind of creatures we are. We have a nature, correct? We're animals. I mean, we're a very unique kind of animal. We have a highly developed linguistic capacity, consciousness, all sorts of things that, as far as we know, other animals don't have to nearly the degree we have. Other animals sometimes communicate, yes? But is there any animal that has the ability to do what we're doing here today? Not that we know of. Other animals can look at the world, analyze, figure out uh, how the world works, but none have the cognitive capacity, as far as we know, that we have. All right. We're animals, we're maybe a, a distinctive type of animal, but that we're still an animal, which means we have a nature. Ants have a nature, correct? Ants have instincts, they're, they're, they're built to do certain kinds of things, correct? Wolves have a nature, rabbits have a nature, yes? No argument there? We have a nature as well. 
The thing to remember, though, is human nature is widely variable. Let's take a, a simple question. Are human beings, we're going to come back to this later, are human beings greedy by nature? Are human beings greedy and self-interested by nature? Well, let's take a poll. We already heard it. Yes, somebody's weighing in quickly. Yes. How many of you have ever acted in a fashion that you would describe as greedy and self-interested? Okay. If you didn't raise your hand, you're a liar. So that's 100%. All right. Now, on the assumption that we are not an idiosyncratic sample of the human species, like we're not a, a freak, a collection of freaks. Obviously, there are some freaks in the room, I'm not saying. But as a group, OK, that means that apparently the capacity to act in greedy and self-interested ways is part of human nature, correct? I mean, we do it. We've all done it. How many of you have ever acted in a way that was rooted in compassion and led you to sacrifice for others even when it didn't benefit you? Okay. This one, some of you didn't raise your hands because there you're telling the truth. You're just bastards. You've never done a, a decent thing in your life, and I accept that. And, but OK, so we all have that. So what is human nature? Is human nature to act in greedy and self-interested ways that ignore the interests of others? Or is human nature to act in compassionate, ways to highlight the interests of others. Which is it? Well, well, yeah, it's both. OK, so obviously we all have that capacity. Most people probably have the capacity to be you know, torturers and to be saints of some type. Right? We probably all within us have that capacity, most of us. Okay. So what is human nature? Well, human nature is all of that. And the question is, which aspects of human nature do we believe are dominant or should be dominant? And then how do we structure the world to foster those aspects of human nature and try to minimize those that we don't believe to be productive and healthy? That's all. So, but there's some idea about human nature under every claim we make in the world. So when you're thinking about these questions about democracy we're going to bring up, be thinking about, well, what's my assumption about human nature underneath it? Let's go to these two competing visions. Popular democracy, the idea that we should be always maximizing participation of ordinary people in a system of government. If one embraces the idea of popular democracy, one is always trying right, to expand and maximize the participation of ordinary people. Right? Now, there's a theory about human nature underneath that, yes? It's an assertion that we have within us, everybody has within us. The capacity to participate, to be part of a functioning, coherent, cohesive group. We, it doesn't mean it's always easy, but if one embraces this notion of popular democracy, the underlying theory is that people have that capacity. It also suggests that people are smart enough to be part of that. Correct? All right. So there is a, a vision of democracy that's often called popular democracy that's constantly thinking about ways to maximize participation. There's another approach to democracy. It especially evolved in the 20th century, although roots go much back much further. But we're going to talk about these things in the distinctly American context. And that's what I'm calling, and others have called, managerial democracy. Managerial democracy. And the goal there is really just institutionalizing elite control. Here's the story that those who advocate managerial democracy basically tell. In large, complex industrial societies like the United States, 300 million people and very, very complex systems, no ordinary person really has what it takes to figure that out. Most people are not capable of active, meaningful participation in those decisions. The theory of human nature in managerial democracy is that the world, in its complexity, has outstripped the capacity of most of us, ordinary people. If you're wondering what I mean by ordinary people, look at the person next to you. That's an ordinary person. Okay? People like us. Most of us aren't terribly special. You know, if we were special, we would have gone to Texas A&M. So, I mean, it's, UT is just the leftovers, people who couldn't get it at A&M, right? <laughs> OK, so. So the idea in this managerial democracy is you all, you know, you're nice people. You 
very nice gentleman. You know? You're just not quite smart enough to figure it out. No offense. I hope you don't take offense at that. No, good. <laughs> nice, but you know, you're probably very good at several things. You probably you know, work hard in your studies, but let's face it, modern society, the economic, the political, the social, all of this stuff is just way too complicated. And therefore, what democracy really means today is not maximizing participation, that's a disaster. From the point of view of managerial democracy, maximizing participation of ordinary people is a recipe for disaster. Because ordinary people cannot cope with the complexity of the system. Therefore, what you want to do is institutionalize elite control. Elite can mean any number of things. For some people, it means just the smart folks. Right? People who are trained in governmental systems, economic systems, whatever it might be. And what you want to do is take the, the smart folks, the elites, the people who know how to manage these big systems, and you let them do it. And the role for the public, for folks like us, is to decide which set of elites we want to run the country. Right? There's a set of elites, for instance, associated with the Republican Party in the United States, and a set of elites associated with the Democratic Party. And your job as a citizen from this point of view is to figure out which set of elites generally represent your idea of the world or your interests. And then you vote for them. And then they go about the business of running the country for you with your interests in mind, but recognizing you're not smart enough to even follow your own interests. No offense. You're very nice people. You're just not quite bright enough. That's the role, that's the, the idea behind managerial democracy. Now, small footnote. Remember what I said the first day of class, I am never neutral, yes? In the style that I have just presented these two competing visions of democracy, which one do you think I favor? Yes, I spoke of the popular democracy in generally positive ways. I spoke of managerial democracy in generally critical ways because that reflects my point of view. Now, that's my point of view, but even though I don't endorse the managerial democracy viewpoint, there are lots of good arguments that can be made on its behalf, and it is something to be argued, it's something for you to think through. Right. So I want to, to be honest in the way I present, recognize my own bias. My own bias comes from many years of experience and study. You have your own experience, your own inquiry, and you'll come to your own conclusion. All right. Two competing visions. What I want to do now to close out is to take a look at uh, a couple of political scientists, a couple of people who come out of the discipline of political science and have studied this notion of democracy. One is a guy named Doug Loomis, who wrote a, a book I like very much called Radical Democracy. Doug Loomis comes out of this vision of popular democracy. He studied uh, government not only in the United States but in other countries and his book Radical Democracy articulates that popular vision or that vision of a popular democracy and here is what Loomis says in that book democracy is not the name of any particular arrangement of political or economic institutions rather it is a situation that political or economic institutions may or may not help to bring about it describes an ideal not a method for achieving it it is not a kind of government, but an end of government. Not a historically existing institution, but a historical project. What does that mean? What Loomis is trying to, to suggest is that democracy is, is a historical project. It's an idea. It's something we strive to attain. And that there is danger when we believe that any one particular set of political or economic institutions have achieved democracy. Because when we believe that our institutions have achieved it, those institutions tend to calcify, tend to become rigid, tend to become inflexible. So Loomis, rooted in this notion of popular democracy, of always trying to maximize the particip participation of ordinary people, says be careful of the idea that a system is the ultimate fulfillment of democracy. Because democracy, he's arguing, is something you have to struggle for. You always have to be looking for ways to expand that participation. And his book goes into great detail. It's quite a good book, I think, if you're interested in reading it. 
I would recommend it. So from that point of view of popular democracy, one of the crucial ideas is that democracy is kind of a living project. That you don't just get to say, okay, we had a revolution, 1776, had the US Constitution, Bill of Rights, and now we have our democracy. Right? That in fact, it's something that takes that ongoing effort. Here's another political scientist, a guy named Samuel Huntington, just died a few years ago, quite well known, Harvard professor. He wrote a book, or he contributed to a book in the 1970s called The Crisis of Democracy. Let me read the quote from there. The effective operation of a democratic political system usually requires some measure of apathy and non-involvement on the part of some individuals and groups. In the past, every democratic society has had a marginal population of greater or lesser size, which, does not actively, which has not actively participated in politics. In itself, this marginality on the part of some groups is inherently undemocratic, but it has also been one of the factors that has enabled democracy to function effectively. This is an articulation of a vision of managerial democracy. Let's take note of the time frame. Huntington is writing in the mid-1970s, on the heels of what we often refer to in this country as the 60s, a phrase that is meant to signal that popular movements, the civil rights movement and various black national and Chicano nationalist movements, the anti-war movement and the youth movement, the feminist movements, the beginning of a gay rights movement, the environmental movement, all of those movements that you've heard about right, were challenging the distribution of power in the United States. And it created a quite messy period. Most of you were not born then. I was a very young person. But we need to remember that the, by the late 1960s, the early 1970s, the United States and the world was destabilized to some degree. And there were a lot of fundamental challenges to power. And there were people in power in the United States who felt that the US system was, in fact, in jeopardy. Huntington was one of them. And so Huntington, along with others, was trying to sort of stitch together a new version of this managerial democracy. And in the crisis of democracy, he's analyzing recent developments and making some normative claims. What he's saying is, listen, in the 1960s, all these people who had previously been marginal, in his words, who were those marginal people? Black people, Chicanos, most women, right? the, all the students, young people. All of a sudden, those people that had been marginal, what did they want to do? They wanted to get in on the action. <laughs> they wanted to participate in the formation of public policy. They wanted to have a say in how the society operated. And that threw the traditional elite control into chaos. And so Huntington is trying to re-articulate that. How are we going to establish a managerial democracy? And he's being very blunt. He's saying that democracy works best when some of those marginal populations stay on the margins and let elites control the system. And he's arguing in, a, in an interesting way that the explosion of participation in the 1960s, and whatever you think about the movements of the 1960s, right, the black nationalist and civil rights movement, the Chicano movement, any of those movements, whatever you think about them, they brought tremendous numbers of people into the political system in ways that they had not been there before. Now, from the point of view of popular democracy, that's a good thing, yes? You're maximizing participation. You're bringing in people into the system that had previously been excluded from the system, sometimes excluded by law, sometimes excluded by everyday practice. So the 60s, a decade that, that's sort of a stand-in for this explosion of political participation, can be seen from the popular democracy point of view as being a positive. The 60s were a good thing because the 60s brought people into the system. Maybe it was chaotic. Maybe some of the people who came into the system had pretty crazy ideas. We look back and think some of them didn't seem very practical. But it brought people into the system. And from one point of view, that's a good thing for democracy. 
From the managerial point of view, that was a disaster for democracy. Because all of a sudden, you had all these people making claims on the system. And people like Huntington were saying, listen, the system works better when those people don't make those claims. He's arguing that there has to be marginal populations in democracy. Now, again, I'm going to reflect my own view here. Samuel Hunting didn't say that corporate executives should be marginal. <laughs> Samuel Hunting didn't say, you know, we need these folks just have to stay on the margins and accept the system. But he wasn't saying that people like corporate CEOs should accept marginality. He was essentially saying, all you people who came into the system in the 60s and the 70s, you got to go back to being marginal. Or you will overtax the system, and the system will no longer function. Now, from one point of view, you could say, well, Huntington is, is not voicing support for democracy here. He's trying to undermine democracy. But from t Huntington's point of view, he was simply articulating a more realistic version of democracy. So popular democracy, the notion of maximizing partition, participation, bringing more and more people into the system, managerial democracy saying that's all well and good in theory, it doesn't work in practice because of human nature and because of the complexity of the systems. One of the things you're going to have to figure out as you go through life, and especially in this course, is which of those visions do you want to attach yourself to? It doesn't mean one is obviously right, one is obviously wrong. It doesn't mean one is based on lies and one is based on the truth. But you're going to have to figure out what you believe democracy really means and how you're going to try to live that vision. <clears throat>